if they emulate what we're doing on those YouTube episodes, they can go out and do it and reproduce that success in the field. We came out with Brown Thrasher as a brand new bird sound. Woodpecker, Lucky Bird, those have been just really good performers. The only reason they got Coyote contest calling done in New Mexico and Arizona is because Project Coyote had a war chest of $24 million and they were paying these directors. My decoy dog turns, runs, and bites the coyote back. She's like, you're not going to bite me, pal. And I was so proud of that dog on that stand. It's a numbers game. The more stands you make, the more times you press that button, the more rabbit distress, bird distress, the more times you play it in good country that you've scouted, that you know there's tracks and scat, the more chance you're going to have to call a coyote in. This is Big Al Morris with Fox Pro, and you're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. You and I and everybody listening to this owns 640 million acres. I think he killed more deer drinking his coffee, smoking a cigarette in the pickup truck than I did spending all that time freezing my butt off. Something that I would hope is that people realize that those are wild animals and they have savage natures. I look forward to packing animals out. I look forward to that pain of success. Doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you live. I've said it before and you know what? I'll say it again louder for the people in the back. Your present circumstance should not limit your passions. This is Jay Scott of the Jay Scott Outdoors podcast. Hey, this is Ryan Callahan. Hi, this is Jules McQueen. Hey everybody, Jason Carter here with Epic Outdoors. Hey guys, this is Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative brought to you as part of the Waypoint Podcast Network. All right, y'all. So hopping into it, this, you know, this show is kind of, uh, I'm, I'm going back to the, the living country in the city of roots in some of my very first episodes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out here at, uh, in Salt Lake City at the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo, uh, not the Great American Outdoor Show and not SHOT Show, sure. um, as, <laughs> as uh, uh, anyone that's been listening has noticed me probably calling it all kinds of different things. Um, but yes, I am here. He is back after, I mean, we're talking like five years. We got Big Al Morris. Sam, it's so good to be with you. And you've changed a little from that guy I met five or six years ago. It's, it's been a, a wild that ride. That sleeve on your arm, every, all that's got to be new, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember how long this has been. There's yeah. got probably something new on the arm. There's, yeah. I mean, you know, I, was, I remember coming to that show. That was my first ever hunting expo and i'll be honest i thought i was coming to this show i right. um I, I had a buddy he reached out um and he's like hey you need to go to this this hunting expo and he's like it's salt lake city da, da, da. and I, so i just google search like salt lake city hunting expo and the ise show ends up coming up and right it ended up you know it ended up working out for out well for me because i didn't you know i didn't know how to approach people for a podcast at the time like i was nervous i was just like i i was, felt super out of my league and and now you're just an old pro at it and you know the mature it's, it's fine i mean that's what our god we get on this earth and we mature but it's pretty impressive to see where you've come in a short amount of time for what you what you started with and i mean we're still using the same equipment that's awesome oh yeah but uh you're kind of a a whole nother level than you were just a few years ago and it's kind of awesome to watch it's been fun and it's been you know sometimes i'll go back i don't really listen to my podcast too much <laughs> but when i do i sometimes i go back and i listen to the old episodes yeah and i'm like those were some good episodes they were good they and got some good information like i almost want to take some of them and re-release them absolutely. now that there's more of a following so people can get that benefit because not everyone goes back and just listens through the the whole you know i mean almost 230 episodes at this point. That's like, crazy. What was I? Five, six, seven, somewhere I mean, in there? It had to, I, I, I'm not sure if I was double digit. You're like seven or 13 or something like that. It was right in that range. Yeah, the beginning. Yeah, we talked We talked to just about calling in general. You know, oh, no. not super specific. We talked about the origin of calls and um, you know, I'm, I'm going to definitely link to this in the on the show notes, or link to it on the show notes page so people can go back and, and listen through it. But, you know, to this day, believe it or not, I've come close a couple of times. I've called several in, but to this day, I have still not killed a single coyote. What? To this day. We need to remedy that. Oh, my God. So, uh, you know, and you'll get a kick out of this. So back before I ever really got into hunting, I started getting interested. And I, for some reason, I got it in my head. I wanted to hunt foxes. Like right. I was going after foxes, which, again, incidentally, that turned out to be the, really the first thing I killed ever was a fox Excellent. but um, a gray it fox was or a, a gray fox, fox down in arizona yeah 
And, but so when I first kind of got this, this itch, I went and bought myself a Fox Pro. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I just got... And so to this day, I am running a 10... Over 10 years old at this point, um, a, uh, a Fox Pro Spitfire. And their money, they still... It, it still works as still good as the day it was made. To, and now, I will admit, and we talked about this earlier, for where I'm at. So, like, you know, where I'm at is wide open. Right. Where I feel like you've kind of got a couple of different ways. You've got right. kind of those enclosed, more wooded areas where... You can call, and you can move 200 yards and call again. Yes. You're using softer calls. Now, that's where I used to call all the time. Mm-hmm. Now I'm in, it's like. Wide open. You can see for 10 miles. Right. <laughs> and right. so, suffice to say, the sound doesn't quite reach no, where it needs time. to there. I mean, that old Spitfire, it's a great call. And on max volume, it's probably going. Now, Kyle can hear you a mile, mile and a half away in mm-hmm. ideal conditions but if there's any wind at all in montana oh, the wind blows especially up there i mean so we're talking you're limited yeah. it'll knock you down if it's blowing five you know here's my deal with wind if it's blowing five miles an hour cut your day in half if it's blowing 10 miles an hour you can cut that in or you know 10 miles an hour will cut your day in for sure in half and 15 or 20 you can cut that down even more so if you were going to call 10 coyotes in and it's blowing 10 10 miles an hour cut that day to five or four and then if it's blowing over 10 miles an hour, cut that again. You're only going to call one or two coyotes in during that day. The heavy wind, wind is the bane of a predator hunter's existence. It really is. And oh, so yeah. That, um, the new, you know, it's amazing to me the advancements we've made on callers just since I met you. Um, we introduced the shockwave, which is probably the best and loudest caller we've ever made. The CS24C was in its heyday, but now we have the X series of callers. And the X series... Uh, the tweeters built into the speaker. It's the most revolutionary speaker that's ever been made. And the X24 is the loudest caller I've ever... It's louder than the old Krakatoa 2s and stuff. And uh, it'll really buck the wind. So that's where we're going to get... We're going to figure out how to get you an X24, <laughs> Sam. So you can go up there into Montana and start tearing those coyotes up. I still think I'm going to avoid the 70 mile an hour wind days. Something yeah. tells me I'm probably not going to be calling much in on no, those. If, it, but... if the temperatures are even close to around 32, <laughs> 70 miles an hour, that's a wind chill of what minus something so oh man yeah it gets rough when i start seeing my flag i gotta give credit to the guys that built my flagpole because that thing is like i swear it's bending to 90 degrees and coming back true but you yep. i digress so you know one of the things i always tell there's a few somebody's getting into hunting and you know unless they're a crazy idiot like me and <laughs> just go straight to an archery elk hunt by themselves right um i i always tell people the the things to start with when you get into hunting that are easy, inexpensive to just do the basics. You've got like things like upland game, you've got duck hunting, and you've got predator Predators. hunting, especially like fox and coyote. And most, depends on where you are, what you can hunt, obviously. What's awesome but, about predator hunting is most states it's open. Mm-hmm. Utah, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, no license required whatsoever. I mean, Idaho pisses me off because they require a license to hunt coyotes. We're doing the Idaho State Division of Wildlife a favor. There wouldn't be a North American wildlife model, and that's what all these wildlife managers tout these days is the, North, the, the concept of the North American wildlife model. There wouldn't be a North American wildlife model if it wasn't for the predator hunters that killed the predators that were eating all the North American <laughs> wildlife. <laughs> we got rid of the wolves once. We got, we're going to have to do it again. And the coyotes we could never get rid of because they're so prolific, but predator hunting is a gateway to other hunting. And more important than that, as you approach these landowners, I can still, there's a lot of places you can still knock on their door. They might not let you hunt their deer. They might not let you hunt their turkeys, but they will let you on their place to hunt the coyotes because they know if you go out there and kill a couple coyotes, you're saving quite a few fawns. You're saving their, their pheasants, their turkeys, their, their, you know, their chuckers, their grouse, their, fe- their rabbits, whatever else they're trying to promote on that ranch, and their cattle and sheep. So, um, you can still knock on doors and get access to private land through predator calling. Well, and you know, here's the thing. You spend a, a, a season or two just knocking off coyotes and you show you're using their land responsibly and all that. The likelihood of you then getting, getting a turkey tag and they say, come to our place and kill one of these turkeys yeah. and a deer tag or an elk tag. No, it's open doors for me. It's still opening doors mm-hmm. for me. I hunted a place for six, seven years, and I couldn't believe the elk sheds I would see in their barn. Mm-hmm. And I kept looking at that lady. I kept saying, ma'am, I sure one day, if you ever let some idiot from Utah want to come hunt a Montana bull, they offered us, and last year we went and hunted their place. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah. and even if, 
you just have zero designs or you know for a fact you're never going to get a chance to hunt a deer or a turkey or whatever on their land. I mean, Kiowa hunting's fun. Oh, it yeah. is high energy. You get a, you can see a lot of action and it's it's exciting. Like, well, you know, you, you, some elk hunts, I mean, you're going days without seeing stuff sometimes right. or, you know, and and for those very short moments. And obviously that happens with calling coyotes too, but they're slow moments, but it's I mean, we I, that's what I've always said about Fox Pro. We sell fun. And those units are fun. You turn them on, something's going to happen. Whether it's just the magpies and the crows showing up, and then when the coyotes show up, and then you never know. When you turn on that distress call, you don't know if it's going to be a coyote. It could be a fox. It could be a wolf. It could be a, a bobcat. It could be a mountain lion. It could be a bear. It could be a grizzly. It could be a black. You don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's usually a lot of fun just because you never really know what you're going to call in, especially in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. There's grizzlies. There's black bears. There's lions. There's bobcats and coyotes and wolves and and that's it's going to be one of those that come to the call but you never know yeah so you know we're talking about predator hunting being an incredible gateway so what are like what are the basics somebody's like you know i want to i want i want to get into hunting you say predator hunting is great because you know it's easy and expensive we kind of talked about the licenses most i would say a majority of states it's safe to say you just typically need just need a hunting license, license. Yes. and that's it. You don't have to yeah, buy tags. Even if you do and, have to buy a license, it's usually the minimum hunting license. Yeah, it's whatever the base the, level is for the, for the most part. Again, check your local hunting regs. Don't give me angry emails yeah. when you go to Nevada and, or Idaho. And, no, um, Idaho needs a license. Yeah. Uh, Nevada doesn't. Utah doesn't. Wyoming doesn't. Montana doesn't. Um, Arizona, you do. California, you do. Um, New Mexico, you do. Um, you know, it's so easy yeah. to go coyote calling. You don't have to buy. I mean. That, so what wait. are we talking as far as like base, base level gear? Yeah. Like what do you need? I mean, if you've got a rifle door. that you shoot deer with, it'll kill a coyote. That's, it's, it doesn't. I mean, my favorite, my favorite rifle right now is a 6mm Creedmoor. Shooting the 105 Black Hornady ammunition. That's a 105 boat tail hollow point match bullet out of a 6mm Creedmoor. 6mm Creedmoor is basically a 243. So if you own a 243, a 22 250, I mean, I don't care if it's a 7 mag or a 300 win mag, you can still go kill coyotes. You don't need to buy a new gun. What's fun is the more you get into predator hunting, you want that flatter shooting gun. That uh, 22 250, that 20, 220 Swift, that uh, 25 aught 6 with a 75 grain VMAX bullet is an amazing predator gun. Um, the 204 is good. The 223, you don't need anything fancy. So any gun you currently have will work. And you can start with a hand call. You can you can take these hand calls that are just moderate in, a, in cost. You know, hand calls are cheap. You don't need to buy an electronic call. But we make, uh, Fox Pro has from a $99 call up to a $699 call. So we make a, we make a caller for every price point on that thing. And, and uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You got into the wildfire, you said? The Spitfire. Spitfire. I mean, it was a lower end call. But here it is 10 years later. It still works for you every day. Mm-hmm. We're the only ones made in America by hardworking Americans. Every other electronic call is made in overseas in China. Um, we're at war with China. We just ain't figured it out yet. <laughs> I mean, it really is. And and why would you support a Chinese com- company? Now, I can't say anything bad about some of the sounds that these other units have. They're, you know, they're, they're awesome sounds. But uh, we have the largest sound library at Fox Pro. We have the best customer service. We have the best warranties. And we're the only ones made in America. So if you do decide you need a Predator call that's electronic, I hope they would. I hope all your listeners look to Fox Pro and, and well, we're going to get you that X24 has become my favorite caller. Here's the thing. Like, I bought this call in 2012, sometime in 2012, right. 10 years ago at this point. And it had been around for a while. And yep. I just, I, you know, just a year or two ago, I was still able to go onto the Fox Pro website, download new sounds, completely swap out my sound library. I mean, it had a lot of great sounds on there, yep. but I wanted some specific stuff. You know, stuff. I wanted to get my vol squeaks and some... We've uh, come out over the last few years with some awesome sounds, so you got to upgrade to some cool sounds. Yeah. And so, like, and, and I knew more at this point. I had gone out. I had been down in Arizona hunting with some buddies. They, they showed me how to hunt. For, like, I had foxes. I got hooked on foxes. That's like, awesome. watching those things dart around and... Um, but they, they taught me 
a lot. And so I was like, oh, I had in my mind, I'm like, okay, these are the sounds I need now. And then I would also went, I'm like, okay, what do I have? What do we have here in the area? So like I'm hunting around the house. I'm using chicken sounds because they yeah. come and raid the chicken coop all the time. All of that kind of stuff. So it gave me an opportunity to, I, I learned a little bit more and then I could go customize to how I wanted to hunt. And if the chicken sounds were working, you know, the kitten distress would work. You mm-hmm. knew that they, you know, anything around a barn, any animals around a barn, you probably could be successful with little piggy, you know, things like that. Yep. Just any of the... Uh, well, because we also in California, a huge wild hog population. Yep. So you're going to hear a lot of little squeals and that's going to well, grow. Well, I've used it in Utah. There isn't any wild pigs in Utah, but it works. <laughs> it doesn't have to be an endemic species there to, you know, get in coyotes interest. To your some ring. extent, a distress is a distress. Yes, and and that's all you're doing is you, you know, I, we sell fun. The Fox Pros are fun, but it, we're trying to arrange the meeting, and and then it's how you choose to push the buttons to arrange that meeting that will separate you. And you can't teach woodsman skills. I know you're a better woodsman today than you were ten years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's something you can't teach, but you can shortcut it. People can go online to Fox Pro Hunting TV, and. Uh, on YouTube, we have Fox Pro Fur Taker episodes. We were on the Outdoor Channel for nine or ten years. Now we've been doing Fox Pro Hunting TV on YouTube, Amazon Prime, Roku, and, and Carbon TV. And it really shortcuts. I, these kids can go watch YouTube, and then all of a sudden, you know, if they emulate what we're doing on those YouTube episodes, they can go out and do it and re- reproduce that success in the field, pressing the same sounds. You've got the same sound list I do and at your, at your fingertips, and you can go out and do it. And so it's awesome. The technology is really amazing to me that somebody can go onto YouTube and just and really just pick it up. Yeah. And, you know, so again, talking, okay, so say somebody wants to get in cheap. They Maybe they got their, their dad's rifle or, you know, a rifle, an old 243 sitting around. Yep. Uh, and, and they're like, okay, you know, I want to pick up some, some hand calls and, and, and learn to use those. I'm going to start. You just make sure you want to do it. Right. I mean, um, you know, we're talking probably I want some basic camo at least. Um, you, you know, know, coyotes live in a black and white world. So when I first started hunting coyotes, it was blue jeans and a plaid shirt. There you go. And, you know, as long as you don't move, they're not going to, they really won't pick you out. Um, but, I mean, why wouldn't you want to get in some camo? You know, there's so many options today in camo and everything else. And you don't got to, I mean, Walmart, at the end of season, they, they, yeah. they, they always have their, that's when, that's when I buy camos when it's on sale. I mean, and especially like, you know, because you can hunt coyotes year round for the most part there's be, there's yes. better times for different sounds and i'm sure we'll probably even talk about that but you can go out you can buy a camo t-shirt you know a pair of tan khaki hiking pants. khaki pants yeah and you're good buy a camo hat or something and, and, and a you're in good $15 place dollar hand call you're you're a wolfer you're out there with your deer rifle with a 15 dollar hand call and you're and you know so then you got to explain to somebody how do you know where to hunt a coyote well the number mm-hmm. one place to find a coyote is where you see coyotes while you're deer hunting turkey hunting pheasant hunting doing rabbit hunting if you see coyote tracks coyote scat but if you physically see that coyote you know he was there and that's where you start start where you know there's some coyotes and then you can get more advanced as you get into the coyote hunting you can go around at night with a howler um cows fed siren uh coyote group locator um you can go around at night and uh start howling at coyotes and if you'll do that at night and the the thing that's really changed for me the last couple years sam is thermals come out Mm -hmm. so we used to be done at night the only thing i could do at night was to go around and howl and locate coyotes now with thermal scopes I can go out at night and start calling those same coyotes that I used to just howl to and get them to answer back. Now I go howling, they answer back, I'll move closer, get three or 400 yards from where I think they are, set up and start calling them in with the thermals and start smashing them at night. So Mm -hmm. it's just amazing to me how technology is really blowing this up to a year round, 365 day, 24 seven, day, night, doesn't matter. It's just getting, and predator hunting I think is where it's at. So as far as like time of day, uh, you know, not everyone's going to definitely if you're starting to start cheap, you're not starting with thermals. Yep. Um, I, I know some incredible uh, guys that make thermals and if they give me a deal and it's still not even cheap for me. No. <laughs> it's expensive. Like, yeah. So but, you know, say somebody again, it just has their hand calls, their rifle, their Walmart camo. They're just cruising out like. What time of day do they want to go out? I mean, can, is it best, reasonable to go throughout the day, evenings, mornings? Best stand of the day is always going to be the first stand of the day. When that sun pops up, 
or the sun's not even up yet, but you can see through a scope, that's the time to start calling on that hand call. And, and the coyotes are still moving. I think they get up a couple hours for light and they're hungry. They want to get something in their stomachs and they'll start hunting. And uh, coyotes will move across the western, and I'm talking Utah, Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, Colorado. Um, if it's below 66 degrees, they'll move all day long. If it gets above 66, it gets hot, and they don't like to be in the heat. Now, Arizona coyotes, New Mexico coyotes, they deal with a different heat. They're, they live in that heat. Yeah. They're used to it a little more. So they'll move until about 72 degrees, and then, then they'll start to limit their activities. The coyotes are the masters at uh, saving energy. They, they don't exude energy they don't need to. They don't put themselves under heat stress. Um, they don't put themselves under stress at all unless they're really trying to get something killed and get that, you know, if they're really desperate, really hungry. Outside of that, coyotes are the masters of their environment. They only move when it's, you know, when they know they the success will be in their odds, in their favor. That's that first stand of the day is the best stand. And then, I mean, it's good up until 10, 30, 11, 11, 30, 12. Then coyotes move to loafing areas is what I call it. And that's areas that little berms little uh, hills that they can bed on if they're cold they'll bed in the sunshine if they're hot they'll bed in the shade of a tree and but they're listening they're listening for that that potential meal that's out there somewhere and then at that three or four o'clock in the afternoon they'll stand up stretch and they'll start hunting those basins that were the rabbits the mice you know 75 percent of a uh a coyotes diet small ground dwelling mammals moles voles mice things like that and then the other 25 percent can be the deer and the, the bigger stuff but Man, that's just been my key the last few years is concentrating on those areas that I think they're loafing in. I'll hunt early in the morning in the, in the flats where I think the coyotes are hunting in, at, at dark. Then in the middays, I'm hunting what I consider loafing areas. And then in the evenings, I'm going back out into the areas I think they're going to hunt. And uh, I'm playing those sounds that are, I think are 75% of what they eat. Vole squeaks, uh, belding squirrel. Um, my, one of my best sounds this year has been uh, prairie dog distress. Um, I still play the rabbits. I, I just think a lot of areas, the rabbits are overdone. I'm, we came out with brown thrasher as a brand new bird sound. Woodpecker, lucky bird, those have been just really good performers. Nutty nuthatch. I was going to say, I've, I've had some success with a nutty nuthatch yeah. before I've seen them coming in. and um, I've, I've had a lot of, we had on the property, my family's property where I used to hunt them, uh, there was a red fox that would hang around. You can't shoot them in California. They're protected in California. Right. But man, was he curious. And he used to come in every time I'd run a, um, it was actually a, a gray fox distress or yeah. uh, one of those. Gray he would fox always come in. Um, gray. And he'd come in and like, I, I didn't even expect, he scared the daylights out of me. Because <laughs> he came in where he should have just smelled me, but he was so focused. I had a decoy run, a little decoy spinning. And he came running in and he was like, three to five feet to my right and i'm looking at him i'm like holy crap and uh since then i've caught him on trail cams a bunch when i you know, throw some stuff out but um it was really interesting when i was filming operation predator video when i was with hunter specialties i was out in nevada and this big red fox comes in and i just shot him because i knew they were legal in utah but then i got to freaking out i'm like I didn't shot. check. Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't check. And it, so I, you know, people of this podcast, please check the rules and regulations. Luckily, when I called the Division of Wildlife in Nevada, I said, I just, I need to know the rules on Red Fox. And the lady said, there's no Red Fox in Nevada. And I, you know, I'm dancing around with her saying, ma'am, I need to know if it's legal to hunt a red. And I knew the gray foxes weren't legal. Yeah. But I did not know about the red fox. And to uh, make a long story short, I finally said, ma'am, I just shot one. I need to know whether, <laughs> whether I need to bury it or whether I can show it to the world. And uh, this officer, she put an officer on the line. He said, look, sir, there's no red fox in Nevada. We don't want red fox in Nevada. So if you did shoot one, it doesn't matter. They're not even on our books. At that point in time, they hadn't even put the red fox. So he said, you can do anything you want with it. And I was like, whew. Whew. But no, check the rules and regulations yeah. where you're at. I shouldn't have shot that red fox not knowing, but I knew it was legal in Utah. I just assumed it would be legal. And you should never assume that because yeah. you don't, like in California, I didn't know they weren't legal. And then for Governor Newsom to tell us we can't hunt bobcats in, oh, in California geez. now, give me a tag for Newsom. I'll hunt him. Oh, yeah. Probably shouldn't I, put that out there. Like yeah, that, maybe but. not. 
Yeah. You get, you're getting a call from uh, getting no. some suspicious phone calls at this point. No, it's um, all good. I just think I really don't think one man has the right to tell us what we can and oh, can't yeah. do. You know, well, tell, what's so, the biologists say? What do the biologists in California say? They say there's plenty of bobcats well, to hunt in California. And but, that's the problem with it. He can't he can't get at the gun owners, so he gets at the hunters to to do that secondarily like it, he does, about, legislates whatever he can to that regard to get at the hunters we talk about predator hunting being the gateway predator hunting is the gateway for project coyote um all these anti-hunting groups um they can't do away with deer and elk hunting so they come after the easy targets mm-hmm. and so they show uh, these these contests where there's hundreds of coyotes laying dead in a in a parking lot and they look at this barbaric hunt that's taking place and then they use coyote hunting in particular to do away with other hunting and it was really ironic because this year in nevada we were you know they were talking about whether to allow contest hunting to continue in nevada so you had the director of wildlife and uh the nine board members that are going to decide the fate of contest calling in nevada and the director of wildlife gets up and touts his North American wildlife model. And then he quotes Aldo Leopold about uh, the quote about if it's good for wildlife, it's good. If it's not, that's apparent too. You know, and he said, I really think these contests are not good for wildlife. And I, so you had to wait and you only got three minutes to respond. And I also just quoted an Aldo Leopold I, quote. And said, Director Wasson, Aldo Leopold also quoted, anyone that would use wildlife to, to promote one agenda or another is a fool. You know, yeah. and I said, <laughs> you know, and this is the same man he quoted. And then I said, Director Wasson, you are an idiot for not supporting these hunts because you wouldn't have a North American wildlife model if we didn't have wolfers, people that went out and, and kept these uh, predator numbers in check. But yet they're bowing, you know, the Director of Wildlife and these... these uh, wildlife managers these nine board members were cowering to project coyote the only reason they got coyote contest calling done in new mexico and arizona is because project coyote had a had a war chest of 24 million dollars and they were paying these directors of these you know these five six ten individuals that have make decisions in new mexico and arizona they were paying them off they were giving them the uh, their little project, mm-hmm. their pet projects, they were giving them funding for some of these other things. But, hey, you vote no to this. Yeah. But what's really odd in Nevada is the Division of Wildlife was promoting a chucker hunting contest on the second to last <laughs> page of their small game manual. It said, you know, come to the Battle Mountain Chucker Contest promoted by the uh, Nevada mm-hmm. Division of Wildlife. Uh, so we got on there. So it's okay to kill a chucker, but you're saying it's not okay to go to a coyote calling contest. <laughs> And I really think there's a lot of pressure. They're using it as a gateway, the coyote as a gateway to, I mean, what do they think? When they get coyotes, you can't do any contest coyote hunting. Do they really think they're going to let them still kill their chuckers too? They don't want them killing chuck. These yeah. people, you know, there's, and that's what's scary, Sam. And I hope your, your listeners get this. You know, only 5 to 6%, 7% of people hunt. And only 2% are anti-hunting. You know, so less than 10% of the pop, 90 some percent of the population out there in America doesn't have an opinion either way. They don't hunt. They don't not, you know, it's not their thing to go hunting. But yet those are the people that decide our fate at a legislative level. So we as hunters and why I'm so glad to, I'll talk to anybody, but I mean, you're a good dude and you've got a great podcast. I've listened to some of your podcasts. Um, we need to get the word out that hunters are good people. We are hunters and fishers, hunter, hunters and fishermen are the best people I've ever met, and uh, we live in the real world. We know what life and death's about. I think these kids that do stupid things at these schools and whatnot—they've never gone hunting. They've never gone fish. They didn't see that fish lose its life, and then they didn't see it, you know, get scaled or filleted, and mm-hmm. they didn't see this deer gutted and the meat processed and the burger ground. And I mean, I really think it's a hands-off world. They play their video games and then they want to go, do, you know, blow people up at a school. I don't understand it. I think people from the country, people that have grown up and and had their hands in the guts of a deer or an elk um, would never consider hurting another human being. It just wouldn't be in their DNA. And that's, I think, hunters and fishermen are the best people on the planet. And these these groups that we're fighting against our rights are the people we need to, uh, we need to organize better as hunters. We've got a better percentage than they do. 
we just need to do a better job promoting amongst ourselves. And, oh, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether you use a flintlock, a bow, a rifle. We all hunt. It doesn't matter whether it's a high fence hunt. Me and you may not go to a high fence and hunt, but they're still hunting. Mm -hmm. So we need to support them, even though it's not our cup of tea. We may never fish with a fly rod. We may only be out there throwing worms and, you know, but that purest fly fisherman is our, they're our friends. We all row in the same boat. We just got to figure that out. Yeah. And, you know, I'll give some love right now to, uh, to my buddy John Salone. And, uh, you know, he's part of uh, Howl for Wildlife. And they're really killing it with, uh, it's, uh, you know, they, they focus on uh, a lot of these attacks on, on hunting, especially with predator hunting. With, yes. I mean, the recent attacks on on. Um, predator hunting in Arizona. Yes. The, uh, bear in California. Yes. Bear in, I mean, Washington. bear everywhere in yeah. Washington. And yeah. like everywhere it seems to be. And yeah. they're really killing it. And it, I, you know, I've done a couple podcasts on it. I've talked about it a ton. But, you know, I'd really recommend everyone go sign up for Howl for Wildlife. It makes Absolutely. it really easy. You get those notifications about when comment periods open up and what, what they're coming after. Um, you know, so I highly encourage. I don't know if my do three minutes made a difference to those nine, but it was five to four. Five mm -hmm. people said, yes, we can still contest hunt in Nevada. Four of them said no. And I don't know where I'd be, Sam, if I didn't have the world championship that I've won four times. You know, now it's all screwed up. The new owner changed the rules, and it's, it's just. But I still, I from Utah, I called Nevada and said, if it wasn't for the world championship Bill Countess rules that I used to hunt, um, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be doing the seminar you just saw me do. Um, it's, it's a platform for us to talk how we do good things for people. Mm -hmm. the, the, they don't talk about the scholarships, the, the studies they've done at these hunts, the scholarship money we've generated. They don't ever talk about that. They talk about how barbaric we are, that we would use a contest to see who's the best coyote hunter on the planet. And, it, you know, I've only come out on top four times. And I did it for over 22 years. And, uh, man, those four times are pretty special to me. And, and I worry about a kid that doesn't have that opportunity. You can't go contest hunting in New Mexico anymore. You can't go contest hunting in Arizona anymore. What I love about Utah is we passed hunter rights bills. At a legislative level, nobody, no group like uh, Project Coyote or any of these idiots can come in here and say no more hunting. You know, we're going to try and get these guys to legislate you out of coyote hunting. We've already passed laws in Utah that say nothing. You can't come in and do away with any form form of hunting and that needs to happen across the united states of america oh yeah, oh, yeah. so getting back into a little bit more of the nitty-gritty stuff here okay. so say you know somebody's picking up their fox pro maybe they don't know the area they're hunting very well uh, as yet what what's maybe a good like base of sounds like i literally they wanted to start developing their sound library like what kinds of sounds would be a good base for someone that wants to start hunting coyotes to start so with a perfect world the sun's at your back the wind's in your face and you've got an opening whether it's 100 300 400 yards open the first thing i'll start out with in the western united states is cottontail rabbit distress mrs mccottontail mr mccottontail cagey cottontail lil's cottontail um Sometimes I'll open up with vole squeaks. And if I if I think there's a coyote closer, you don't want to scare them, and you want they'll come to that vole squeak. I literally have video after video of coyotes three, four, five, six, seven hundred yards away turning on vole squeaks. They st I saw a coyote laying there one day at seven, six, seven hundred yards in Colorado. I turned on vole squeaks. That coyote stood up and ran and died about twenty yards from me. <laughs> um, it's an amazing thing. So start with the prey distress. You want a good variety of prey distress. The voles, the moles, uh, the, the vole squeaks, the belding squirrel, the um, prairie dog distress. Then you want the rabbits, all the cottontails. And then you want a few jacks in there, that lightning jack, that devil raspy bunny. Raspy jack. Raspy jack. Um, uh, jack rabbit distress. Those are awesome. And then you're going to need some of the birds, you know, the lucky bird, the nutty nuthatch, the, the brown thrasher, um, some of those bird sounds. And then you want some vocals. You want the single lone vocals, female sore howl, female yodel howl, C5 young pup howl, male coyote howl. Those are the four single howls I'll use off the Fox Pro. And then I do female submissive, which is a, a pair. Coyote pair is another coyote pair sound. Um, we've got a goose collar out in the hall. <laughs> um, and then we have den mayhem, and then we have the pup fights, the 
whippy pup, nutty nut pup. Um, those are my two pups in distress that are just being money for me right now. And so if you have those prey distress sounds, not, you know, you don't need a whole, you don't need 600 of them. You need the 20 that are really good. Mm -hmm. And then some of those single, single lone howls are the number one howl that a coyote will come to. But they actually recorded me two years ago in the sound studio. So you can take Al Morris with you. <laughs> AM yips and whimpers, all my elk sounds. If it's legal, to, like in Oregon and, and uh, Wyoming, you can use electronic elk. In Arizona, you can. In Arizona, you yep. can. Utah, you can too now, I think. So anyway, you can take me elk hunting with you, you can take me coyote hunting with you, and you can actually have me calling for you off that fox bro. You know, I'll tell you, I think it was, uh, I've had a lot of luck with the pup distress. Um, and you know, that'll, that'll probably depend on the time of year, too. You want to do that when they're actually going to have pups. But, but it works year-round. It really? does. It, it works year-round. Absolutely. Because um, I think, uh, you know, I've, got, I've called in a handful, and uh, one time I was hunting with my nephew, and we had one come in, and apparently... I'm sitting there. I'm like, why the hell is he not shooting? Right. He's sitting there waiting for me to tell him to shoot. Yeah. He was he was younger at the time, and then and uh, so finally he took the shot, but it was kind of a rush shot because the coyote was taken off and he missed it. But then you know we're sitting there, we're like, okay, you know we don't move, we're, like, we're calling, 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 and we just know there's another one out there. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden we we're, we're kind of in this river bed kind of area. It's like a creek bed, and so. We got our backs up against the wall of this creek bed, and we hear, like, you know, two feet above our heads, like, this crunch, crunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, no way. Because, like, the wind's right in our faces, but that creek bed must have kind of kept it down. And he walks up, and he's, like, two feet above my head. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, there's, there's, like, no way you can move in that no, point and, like, get it. And get it done oh, my gosh. Then. But then uh, the one I finally almost got... Uh, I was shooting. I, was, I had a shotgun on me, and that's, I, that's money. It, it was all it was all up close, um, and uh, called him in. I think it, I think again. It was either a it was either a jack or a, a pup distress or something. It was it was something aggressive. Like and he, he came, came in. he came in and then you know he saw the I think he knew something was off. He saw the decoy though, and so it was it was he kept inching in and inching in, and he finally kind of locked up, and it was right at the effective range of my shotgun. And I took the shot, and he just went down. He, he just went straight down. And I'm like... So you got him. I'm like, heck yeah. I stand and up, I go to off. walk to him, and he just got up like he was nothing and was gone. Yeah. And I tracked him. I like I tracked the blood on that sucker so for hard. a while, and it just disappeared. And Well, just so you know, he died. I'm fairly certain probably, that those yeah. BBs went through him and through his lungs and stuff, and he probably didn't survive. The problem is they can go four, five, six hundred yards. Mm-hmm in the really thick stuff and they'll find a deep dark hole to climb into and and uh so while you didn't get to enjoy him know that you probably killed him dead as a smack and yeah but you know hey they're tough they're some of the toughest critters i've ever to keep down especially with a shotgun um you know i've i should be a i'm a four-time world champ but i should be a six-time and twice uh, I knocked coyotes down with a shotgun we didn't get, and it mm -hmm. would have made the difference. I've seen a coyote worth four thousand dollars in a world championship. So, even you know, you know the heartbreak it was for you not to get that coyote. Picture yeah. one that was worth four thousand dollars more in cash <laughs> and prizes, and uh, you know it would have gave you another world championship. So yeah. I've been there. So what you know. Say or somebody's like, okay, I, I know there's coyotes in this area. You know, I heard them howling or, you know, I saw them. I saw them when I was out for a hike and off in the distance. I want to hunt them. What features do you, I mean, we talked about some of the features where they like to be. Right. But what features do you look for when you're setting up a stand for where you're going to set up? I just want to, um, I, honestly, every stand I look at is, uh, I like elevation. So I like to be above where I set the collar. Um, I'm trying to position the coyotes. Every time I look at a stand, I'm looking for a place to position a coyote so I can kill him. I want to get a clean shot. I don't want him to come down. I don't want him to hook through the trees. I don't want him to get where I can't see him. So consequently, I don't like things in front of me. I don't want brush or trees in front of me. I want an opening. I want to be able to see straight to the collar. I want to be able to see the Fox Pro. And I usually only set it 30, 40 yards because most of the time I have a shotgun with me and a rifle. Mm -hmm. So I know I can kill anything that comes hard charging. We can, you know, doing the drive-by, some will run in and run out and never stop. But they, they come 10 feet from the collar. And if you've got a rifle and it's on, even if it's on nine power, at 25, 30 yards, you're just seeing bits and pieces of that coyote <laughs> as he flies by. 
So having a shotgun can be critical. I carry a rifle and a shotgun to most stands. Um, not so much when I video, but when I'm contest calling or calling for fun, mm -hmm. I always have a shotgun with me. And I'm trying to position those coyotes. And I use the wind to help do that. I usually am downwind of my collar, about 30, 40, 50 yards. And I'm trying to position those coyotes. If they circle the collar to get the wind, they're usually right in my wheelhouse. And I'm going to screw them up that way. So it, it's, it's, you know, I've done this. I got to thinking about that. I killed my first coyote when I was 12. I'm 55. I've been cutting coyotes a long time. And now it's just second nature for me to figure out when you say, what do you look for in a perfect stand? Honestly, it's a little elevation openings that I can see. I love sagebrush or, or, or buck brush or anything, but I, I want to be able, I try to stay out of the thickest stuff. But, Obviously got to make sure you have your wind, right? Yep. Yeah, but I mean... I used to, okay, so Sam, I used to worry about the wind a lot. Okay. I mean, I used to always have to have the wind in my face and I, you know, I'd position myself and now I quit worrying about the wind as much. I look for more where I can set up and see the best. And, um, I don't care if the wind's coming straight off the back of my head going right out, as long as those coyotes have to circle out into that opening for me to see, I, they're going to end up downwind. That's a coyote's nature. So position, let the wind help you position those coyotes where you're going to kill them. And if it means you've got to set up and you're, if any coyote's going to wind you, you can see 400 yards, you'll kill most of those coyotes if you can shoot. So um, I used to, the wind used to be a big, bigger deal for me. Mm -hmm. Now my cameramen lose their, they're like, the wind isn't good. So if he comes out there, we're going to video him, you know, and then they go, oh, and it's, it's working out. I'm making more stands, um, more stands in a day. That's really all it is, is a numbers game. If you really want to break coyote hunting down, it's how many stands you make in a day. I only call a coyote about one every three stands. Yeah. So if I'm going to kill, you know, six, seven coyotes, I've got to make a lot of stands that day. <laughs> um, at the World Championship, me and Garvin would make 32 to 35 stands during daylight hours. And uh, the next day, we'd make 14 or 15 stands. So... And we wanted to hit on 50% of those stands. If we called in 50% of those stands and we killed those coyotes, we knew we were going to have our 10, 12, 15, 20 coyotes. And we're going to win that contest. And so um, it's a numbers game. The more stands you make, the more times you press that button, the more rabbit distress, bird distress, you know, vole squeaks, the more times you play it in good country that you've scouted, that you know there's tracks and scat, the more chance you're going to have to call a coyote in. So, you know, and I'm sure this probably depends on, on the stand itself and the terrain, but how long do you, like, kind of what's, what's your rule of thumb as far as how much time you spend at any given stand? So at the, when I'm hunting contests, I only stay 8 to 12 minutes. When I'm hunting for video, I'm staying 15 to 20 minutes. If it's just me and you having fun, we're trying to get your first coyote. I'm staying 30, 40 minutes. I want you to shoot a coyote, so I'm going to stay there longer and play more sound and try and give us more options on a stand. But honestly, I've kept a journal since I was 16 years old, and 72% of the coyotes I kill come between 3 and 7 minutes. The nether 12% come between 7 and 10 minutes. 7 to 12 minutes, somewhere in there. But 7 to 10 is the next biggest percentage. And then there's a percentage from 10 to 12. There's a percentage before 3 minutes, and there's a percentage after 12 minutes. But uh, honest to goodness, you know, most of your coyotes are going to come between 3 and 7 minutes. Um, if you've been there 15, you've probably done mm -hmm. your due diligence. 20 minutes for sure. Bobcats will take a little longer to come in, so you can stay a little longer on a bobcat. But... Um, Stay 15, 20 minutes, you know you've covered it, and move on. Okay. And how far, like, you know, again, I assume this probably depends on terrain, too. But, like, how far do you, are you talking, uh, are, you, are you usually moving? You know, it depends on how loud I played the sound um, and how much the wind is blowing. If the wind's blowing 10, 15 miles an hour, I know I only need to go a half mile, three-quarters of a mile, and I'm in new airs, new, new dirt. Um, if there's no wind and you play, I'm going to give you an example. Quite a few years ago, I was hunting coyotes about, I want to say 15, 20 years ago. I was in Nevada and I started calling. I set the caller about 30 yards from me, turned it on, and I look across this valley and I see this two track going and it went six miles across this valley. 
And I turn the collar on and I look and I go, there's a jackrabbit. And I put that 14 power Pentax scope on my 220 Swift on him and it was a coyote. And 12 minutes later, I shot that coyote 25 yards from me. I loaded him and the collar up on my Toyota and went 2.3 miles to where I saw him jump out on that two track. Yeah. That coyote heard me two miles away, over two miles away on Jeez. that two track. So that's when I realized that sound in optimum conditions, no wind, a little bit of snow on the ground. And so that's when I started realizing I needed to put more distance between my calling sets. I needed to go at least a mile, mile and a half to get to fresh ears. And so that's my, I move about a mile, mile and a half between sets. If the wind's really blowing, I'll shut, shorten that down to half, three quarters of a mile or a mile, depending on the, the volume of wind. And if it's over 10 miles an hour, you're only, you're not covering. That sound isn't getting away from you very far especially the upwind side it's getting away from you downwind and that's when i really set up to watch downwind because mm -hmm. i know those coyotes are going to hook that wind to smell whatever's making that noise so we talked a little bit about kind of rifle caliber i mean you can shoot a coyote with just about any anything you want you know anything. um i know actually, guys have done it with 50 bmgs uh, i'm actually really excited i've got a i've got a 243 uh lever action henry that uh, excellent and the fun thing about that, I put uh, peep sights on it. I put open sights nice. on it. So I'm good out to 100 yards with that. Um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of replaced my rifle a little bit because that, you know, you can get 10 yards away. You can swing that sucker up Absolutely. and plug something. Um, but I'll still bring my scope out for, you know, Long range. for past, you know, past yeah. that 100 yard mark. Right. But I'm, I'm really excited to, I, I haven't blooded it yet. Um, well, so I'm really it. excited to do that one. But, I need uh, to come see you in Montana. We oh, need to, yeah. We need, to, we need to fix this uh, no killing kind of thing. <laughs> but then, you know, we were talking a little bit about shotguns. What, I mean, there, there's such a variety. What, what would you recommend for you know, using your shotgun for coyotes, what like you know, minimum? I like a good semi-automatic. I don't care whether it's a Brett or a Benelli. I like the semi-autos. You can use a pump, and it works fine. But a Hornady makes that three-inch nickel-plated BB uh, okay. coyote load. It's money. Winchester makes a coyote load. Federal makes a coyote load. Uh, any of those big brand coyote loads. Of course, then there's dead coyote and some of those heavier than lead stuff. The TSS. Mm -hmm. um, there's Apex Ammunition's a new one. I haven't used it. Apex. I talked with them like two years or two years ago at Shot Show, and they're they're good old Southern boys. I like them. I like them. They're, they're a cool and, product. That ammunition's up. A lot of coyote hunters I know are shooting Apex now, and and uh, you know I'm a Hornady boy, so I'm shooting that three inch mm -hmm. nickel plated uh, BB, and uh, it works for me. And uh, that's just, you know, shoot a uh, triple BB throughout the years of contest calling. I, I shot a triple BB load from Federal that uh, it was tungsten iron and uh, it crushes coyotes. It just, it crushes them. It breaks their, the, the BB doesn't seem to break their legs like the triple BB and the, the T and the, and the four buck and the, that, I, it, it can have holes in the pattern. So I've just, I've somewhere around that triple B, uh, BB to triple B, you're not getting any holes in the pattern and you're, you're breaking them down. Okay. Um, so another, another, uh, another question here, to decoy or not to decoy? <laughs> you know, honestly, when all these decoys were put on these collars and it's a big fad, decoying is 25, 25, 50. 50% of the time when you're running a decoy and a coyote's coming in and sees that decoy for the first time, they will stop and stare at it. 50% of the time, they'll stop and stare at it. 25% of the time, they will turn and run. And 25% of the time, they will run up to it and try and eat it <laughs> in front of your face. So why would you, about 75% of the time, would you stop that coyote from coming to the collar? And so I've started, when I run a decoy, I really want to watch that first coyote reaction. If that first coyote reaction is stop or leave, I don't turn the decoy on the rest of the day. If the first coyote that comes in tries to eat it, then I'll run the decoy the rest of the day. And I've noticed throughout different parts of the country, just from Idaho to New Mexico, California to Vermont, um, coyotes react differently to the decoy. Mm. And, and honestly, I don't run the decoy very often. And now the other thing I've started running is I've always had a critter decoy or a black and white decoy. And we just came out with a bluebird topper and I'm into it about 20 coyotes now. And it has yet to get a rejection. I've yet to have a coyote stop, 
or I've, well, they've stopped and looked at it, but they keep coming to get it. So the blue has been, I don't think they can see the color blue. I just don't think it's offensive, and it, I don't know. Um, the bluebird topper's pretty special right now. So uh, um, next time we talk, I'll give you an update on what I there think of the, the bluebird <laughs> topper. So now so. there's something, uh, something else we talked about. Uh, in the very first episode, you kind of mentioned it, and it was actually one of the very first comments I'd ever gotten on one of my podcasts from a listener is uh, decoy dogging. Um, and their immediate thing was, oh, my gosh, why couldn't you guys have gone more into decoy dogging? Nice. So, so I'd love it if you could kind of, what, what is decoy dogging? Well, decoy dogging is when you take a dog, and uh, there's breeds of dogs that seem to be inherently better to decoy with, and that's the White Mountain Cur line. Out of you know, they call them Kimmer Curs, some of guys, and this one guy in Wyoming started making these White Mountain Curs, and they just bred for hunting coyotes, and which also happens to be John Bear's nickname. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, on on Instagram, huh? That's yeah. his handle, White Mountain Cur. Um, they're just inherently the cur line is a tough dog it, it, to be a decoy dog they've got to be tough because if a coyote can run up and kill them they will and you know jag terriers those smaller patter patterdale terriers they're they're just a little small and a 35 50, 40 pound coyote can really do damage to a 12 15 pound dog yeah so you need a 25 pound dog at least it would be my minimum 20 25 pounds i've got a couple dogs in that 23 to 25 pound range a little bit and teddy teddy's 28 little bits 23 pounds um they're about as small as i'd go for decoy dogging and then the problem is they've got these uh black mouth curs that some of them get 60 70 80 pounds and the, those are too big. Those are too. Those dogs are intimidating to a coyote. Yeah. So you want to run a dog that's not intimidating. About the same. You want a 35 pound decoy dog, and the curs seem to be that they fit that bill. Now, Cata, some guys like Catahoulas, and some guys breed um, uh, collies and and uh, uh, you know the the cattle working breeds. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of all their. They're different names, but the healers, uh, and the healers, and and you know what? They're great dogs. They're great people dogs. They're great cattle dogs. But at the end of the day, a blue healer was meant for cattle. A uh, collie, border collie, was meant for cattle, and it's really hard to breed that. You can't breed it out of them. They, I've actually seen mm-hmm. a half collie, half cur. When a coyote's coming, it would lay down and hide from the coyote, you know, and that's not what it, you want it to be the decoy. You want that coyote to see the dog, and you want the dog to bring the coyote to you. Um, I, I had some guys, I used to tell them that Gritta, my white decoy dog, would go eight, her record's 1,840-some yards. She went and picked up a pair of coyotes, and we shot it at 25 yards, the pair. Um I had several guys call me a liar. The only problem is I had witnesses. And <laughs> what's funny is the guy that was calling me a liar now has his own breed of dogs, and I'm not going to mention them. But uh, now he's touting that his dogs will go a thousand yards to pick up a coyote <laughs> and bring them back. Where before he called me a liar for my. And you know we were doing stuff. We learned old school techniques from uh, government guys, and. Uh, we were doing things and training our dogs better than most most guys have a decoy dog sit next to them and then when the coyotes show up they engage the coyotes but they don't let them range Mm -hmm. and uh i like my dogs to go out and pick up coyotes and bring them back to me the problem is if they're out bringing a coyote you know if they hear a coyote a long ways away and then another coyote shows up i usually hunt with more than one i usually hunt with two um if there's lots of coyotes in the area, I'll have three decoy dogs out, and I keep one of them with me and let the other two go ranging. Okay. And, uh, you know, there's lots of secrets to training, but the number one thing for decoy dogs is to put them on, on coyotes. That's the, the number one way to, whether they're Catahoula bred, whether they're, you know, healer bred, what, all these breeds will do the deal. Um, it's how you train them and how many coyotes you put in front of them really makes the difference to what a good decoy dog will be. I personally don't like the cow dog breeds. I don't like the healers. I don't like the 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 cow breed dogs. Uh, the Catahoulas are fine. You know, they're mostly pig. They use them a lot for pigs and whatnot. Um, I stick with the curs. I don't like black mouth curs. I like the Kimmer curs, the... the um, that cur line is just a better makes a better decoy dog in my opinion 
So now the idea with that is the dogs are effectively, they're small enough where a coyote's kind of like, I want a piece of that. And the dogs will run out, taunt the coyotes a little bit, and they're bring trying to bring them back. That's the whole idea behind it. Yeah. And, and with that, you're probably, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably shooting them a lot closer because... Yeah. Obviously, you don't want to shoot your dog. <laughs> a, a coyote won't tolerate a domestic dog in their core home area when they have pups in the dirt. So they just, I don't know whether they're going to try and kill the dogs and feed the dogs to the pups or whether they're just so pissed that that dog would be in their territory while they have pups. And I think they're protecting their pups. They want to keep mm-hmm. that dog from getting their pups. But t- they can be some really close encounters. And it gets so chaotic, you really have to pay attention where... I mean, we had some video last year where a buddy of mine shot a coyote, but I didn't see my red dog coming, and they actually wouldn't let us air the footage because it was so... They literally slowed it down, and that bullet was only about a foot from my dog. Now, the guy knew the dog was safe, and I know he knew when he pulled the trigger he wasn't going to hit my dog. But on video, it looked the angles looked so different. Yeah. Where the camera was 10 feet to our right, and that it looks like the bullet and the dog are going to collide. And uh, they didn't want to air that footage, and I was pissed because it was really good footage of one of my pups. <laughs> she fired on this one male coyote. The coyote actually comes up and bites my dog on the butt. <laughs> Jeez. And then the coyote turns and takes off running. Well, instead of coming to me, my decoy dog turns, runs, and bites the coyote back. <laughs> she He's like, you're not going to bite me, pal. And I was so proud of that dog on that stand. We, we didn't show the footage because it was so chaotic and so scary. Um, you've really got to pay attention. And, uh, you know, guys that are woodsmen, I don't worry about. It. You know, it's it, 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 you just, after you do it for a while, it's not as chaotic as, as it looks on video. So is there uh, is there a better time of year then? Is does a decoy dog and work like you said no. a lot better when so when they're works, pupping? It only decoy dog and only works when the pups are in the dirt. So if they breed February fifteenth, they're born the last week of April, first week of May. They usually that fifteen days those pups don't they stay their eyes are closed they don't do anything and then the next 15 days so at 30 days they're just poking around the den it's 60 days they start to poke outside the den so that's not till June and then July they're hunting with mom and dad they're getting into trouble so there could be three or four pups different directions mom and dad are trying to keep track of all these little puppies and and uh, they're trying to protect them and that's when it's the best June and July first 15 days of August are the best decoy dog in months by far it starts as early as May 15th if they bred in December and those pups are born in uh, March and then by May they're getting into trouble then may 15th i really like kansas oklahoma okay. some of that midwest country that they probably have their pups a little earlier than we do in the intermountain west in the intermountain west it's june and july first okay. 15 days of august all right so if folks want to want to see some of the hunts uh, or see some of the stands if they want to follow along with what you're doing online where can they find you fox pro hunting tv on youtube amazon prime roku uh, Carbon TV, GoFoxPro.com is our website. We've got all the callers, all the hand calls, all the electronics, all the. We've got lights. We've got merino wool. I mean, Fox Pro is really getting into some diverse and, and uh, prosperous things, and and uh, they can really shortcut their learning by going to Fox Pro Hunting TV and and watching us on video do our thing. And uh, it's a, it's that's a good value to your uh, podcast listeners to to go. That's a good resource for them to learn about predator calling awesome and if if what is your instagram account um big underscore al morris at uh instagram yeah big underscore al morris awesome well i will make sure to link to you all of that on the show notes page i'm glad we got to sit down and and finally reconnect we've been talking about it since sam it's Shot always show a pleasure two years ago. you've really come a long ways and my hat's off to you my friend for for all you've accomplished and the dreams you're chasing and and keep chasing brother Awesome. Thank you, man. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com and get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. That'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and play in your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 